This is how you come down. One day, not even a day. Got to. We have to get up at four o'clock in the morning tomorrow morning, our morning, to get home, which puts us at home for six thirty a.m. the same day. <laughs> it's weird. It's like you're going back on the calendar day. Six thirty in the morning, going to be home in Canada tomorrow. Finally, can't wait. In some ways, and sad to leave here and others but overall it's been a very very effective reset a good reset for sure and uh, i see clearly the direction i need to go when i get home things i need to do and am going to do now i tried i tried my hardest last night to get some voices heard and i just couldn't do it i was too tired too done a few funny stories from yesterday i'll save for another time but a uh, quick topic, quick mention that needs to be mentioned. Maybe you're not interested. I don't know. It doesn't matter to me. There's going to be emails heard in a second. When I shared, I shared a video, I don't know what it was, a week ago or something, in the community page on my YouTube channel. All you have to do is look for the community page on my YouTube channel. Scroll through my posts there. And I shared a video made by a couple of brothers who traveled south to Central America, Americas, and they joined the trek with all of the immigrants who have been encouraged to migrate to the United States southern border. And uh, some puzzle pieces that were filled in for me watching that was, what's going on, man? Like, who's behind this? This is absolutely crazy. I'm, I just don't understand enough. And they showed firsthand proof of the maps that were made for the immigrants by the United Nations and the Red Cross showing them different routes they could take to quote sneak into the into the country through the southern border but in the meantime the dangers the absolute insane dangers that the United Nations the United States government and the Red Cross encouraged families people with children to do you cannot get more dark and evil than that as far as I'm concerned. You realize how many, here's a point that a lot of people aren't taking into consideration, and yeah, I am going to, ta am going to take a minute to talk about this, and I will share a whole pile of crazy experiences from the people, but I need to share this angle to look at this that not too many people are pointing out. Now, as most of you know that are, have been on this channel for any length, amount of length of time, 
I am a professional outdoor guide. I can take, by myself, I could take a handful of horses into the Rocky Mountains for a couple of weeks and come back with all of them, no problem. I can take human beings into the mountains, into remote Rocky Mountains. I can take human beings in there and bring them home safely. I would never dream in a million years of encouraging a family without the correct gear, food, provisions, and safety to go on even a, a 10, 15 mile journey into the mountains that I guide in with their infant children because somebody's going to get seriously hurt if not killed. The amount of families that we have seen that are getting shredded and torn apart because of that journey alone is so heartbreaking and sad and hard to watch. The amount of children that are being separated and losing their families on that journey, the amount of people that are dying along that route is absolutely wrong and 100% preventable. It's like, how many of you would advise a family to go jump in a boat without life jackets, even for a one hour trip? Nobody, right? It's stupid. You're not gonna, you don't want people to take that chance of somebody maybe getting injured, right? From doing something stupid, which just be going into a boat with a life jacket. How many mothers and fathers are encouraged to throw their infants into a car and not use a car seat or a seat belt? None, right? It's illegal to have your infant in a car without a seatbelt, right? Just as subtle, subtle um, comparisons. How many, what government, what Red Cross, what United Nations group encourages families, poverty-stricken families to take on jungle treks where there's bandits kidnapping, holding for ransom, Drugging children, stealing children, raping children, malnutrition, disease, injuries, the list goes on. The United Nations and the Red Cross and the current American government have actually printed off and handed out pamphlets of the routes they're suggesting these families with children take is abs it's the six that is you cannot get more dark and satanic as far as i'm concerned why am i saying that because i am familiar with what it takes to take a trek through a big chunk of timber and mountains let alone a freaking jungle anyways that's just something that uh that's one item that's going on that i needed to make sure there was light being brought to all right you cannot get more dark and sinister as far as i can well you can obviously but I'll tell you what, as an example of dark and sinister, of what these groups have done to how many innocent families who were just fueled by hope, and uh, they've been led to believe that the UN, the Blue Helmet guys, and the Red Cross are, are they're, they're the good people. They wouldn't mislead us. They wouldn't, they wouldn't slide us and encourage us to take on that trek through that jungle and lose my children, would they? Well, they did. And they're still doing it. They've done it. How many times, how many families have been shredded and children taken? They also showed that, uh, listening to those two brothers that video, they're talking about how once you got to the border, if you had children, they ushered you through the border more smoothly. Shit piles of children were being taken and stolen and uh, allegedly drugged to help individuals get past the border and then the kids are dumped on the other side of the border. <laughs> Who's benefiting from all those children? Anyway, I'll bite my lip there. That's what I had to say and point out. The United Nations and the Red Cross have been and are encouraging families of poverty-stricken families to take on a journey that even the most skilled mountaineers to tackle Everest wouldn't do. And to take their infant children along with them. Holy shit. Some frickin' necks need to be stretched. Prove me wrong. Some necks need to be stretched. Now, moving along. Who do we got that needs to be listened to, heard? It's more important than my annoying voice. Let's get it going. This is Tyler Yosemite. Some of these are, I think these are, these are predominantly new ones, this volley. 
The Yosemite tribe, led by Chief Tenea, were composed from multiple renegade tribes, including the Mono Paiute from the Eastern Sierra. The Paiute were traditional enemies of the more peaceful Miwok people. Yos, from the Greek Yos, meaning to kill, means those who kill. The suffix Meti means one who kills. It was used by the nearby Miwok tribes in prehistoric times. Several tribes who coexisted with the Yosemite people regarded them as killers. The Yosemite saga is one for further research and fascinating. I do not know if the reference to the Sabe is warranted at this time, but I will do research to find out and will advise as I have the time being an old dude and retired. Either way, it's all fascinating. Let the doors open so we can see and understand. Frank, North Carolina. Okay, old dude. Thanks for the update on your, on your diggings. You got my curiosity. And share away with what you come up with. I know one thing, the Comanche were, I think the Comanche tribes of days gone by held the number one position of terrifying the shit out of everybody, no matter if you were indigenous to this land or not. They were some nasty sons of bitches. They did some killing. Not only killing, they did some nasty shit. Now, this is titled, We Finally Know What All This Paranormal Was Now. All right. Hi, Steve. Hope to find you well. I'll try to make this as short as possible. In 2006, Upper Lower Michigan, one mile off the road, Upper Lower Michigan. So probably meant Upper UP. I don't know. One mile off the road, camper with pond. One. On lane to pond, the biggest apple tree loaded with apples. Overnight, the apples disappear and the top of the tree all broken down. The game warden called, said probably a bear, even though no claw marks. Number two, setting a campfire supper time setting. Okay, this is, uh, I think they're, they're meant to be titles of each thing, but they're not. They just blend into the sentence. That's why I'm being a little awkward this time. Number two, setting at campfire supper time. Calm wind, sound of the biggest tree crashing to the ground in the same area as the apple tree. Well, jumped up and looked that way, saw nothing. Number three, as I didn't stay there. Usually went up weekends. A few weeks later, I arrived to find the roof of my shed had collapsed. No wind damage noted. There was no, tr there was no tree that had fallen. As I inspected the damage, I saw the I-beam center, the strongest part of the roof support, had been twisted like licorice. I couldn't believe my eyes. Number four, at around October 20th, 2006, I will never forget. I'd went out, arrived back at camper after dark. As I parked, I was immediately struck with fear and dread. I've been camping, I had been camping years. I sat in the car for moments trying to get a grip. I was so frightened, I sprinted for the camper and locked the door. I went to sleep, thankful for the couple, thankful for the couple drinks I'd had. I went right to sleep. Sometime in the middle of the night, I opened my eyes to light, to light in the camper with no electricity. This is concerning. It was real bright, the brightest light I had ever seen, an orb. It was now floating toward me, about a volleyball slash bass size. I felt calm at ease of all things. I moved o It moved over me to where I could have reached out and touched it. I did not touch it. The light was blue to whitish color. I watched in amazement. It was moving so slow and then it went through the wall and disappeared like the wall wasn't even there. It was gone. I found out later I'd been tagged. I explained. Number five, at home, months later, 100 miles away, I and the wife were asleep in the middle of the night. In the morning, my wife said, did you hear that loud noise out of the shed? I said, no. She said, the loudest noise she ever heard was going on at the tin roof shed and it scared her so much she started crying when she couldn't wake me up. I went out to inspect it and I found nothing. I've heard crashing of tree falling in my yard at home also nothing. Thanks for having us be able to understand this. A lot of us have seen have some puzzle coming together. Thanks to you, sir.
I saw a figure or something by the side of the road near my pond with glowing amber red eyes for a different time. I listen most nights and thankful for your work. I would love to meet you and have a beer. Fish, fished, hunted, and trapped all my life, D. Okay, man, you're gonna see, you're gonna soon see that you should have included it. But we appreciate you coming forward with what you have experienced to date and the blue the the ball of light in your personal space. That's not the first time that's been shared. That's been noted inside human dwellings. How many times now? A lot. That would freak anybody out. But the one part this, of this story that I've heard numerous times, it kind of bothers me, not bothers me, but I have a big curiosity of is how is it so many times people go to wake somebody up when something absolutely crazy and insane is going down and they can't wake them up? It's like the person who's witnessing it is almost in a dream, in a dream, right? I'm not saying they're in a dream, but it's like something to compare it to. Shit's going down and everybody is sound asleep and they will not wake up. Shaking the shit out of them. Yelling for them to wake up and they just sit there in a coma. <laughs> right? How frustrating would that part be on top of what you're witnessing? And why is that? Why is that? Pretty sure we're going to find out. Actually, I'm certain we're going to have the answers to everything at this stage of the game for me. I am certain. Certain. Send more when you get it, man. And be safe. Above all, be safe. Go with your gut instincts. But whatever you learn, if you want to share it with the people through me, give her. Sullivan Creek Sasquatch Encounters, a Tyler's email. Hello. My close encounter took place in the Colville National Forest in Washington State, September 2023. I was tent camping six miles up Sullivan Creek Road with my dog, and things were pretty quiet that weekend. Even the ranger station back in town was already closed for the year. It was my third night camping there, and I was supposed to leave early in the morning. Something spooked my dog while we were sitting at the fire that night, and knowing that no one else was camping out there, I let her bark it out. She hadn't done that on previous nights, but she's a sharp dog and I assumed she just heard a deer. However, she didn't stop after five minutes, so I had to grab her and try to calm her down at the fire. But she wasn't, but she was in full guard dog mode. I've been working in the woods as a field biologist for 10 years and I've heard dozens of Sasquatch stories from coworkers. But I'm unfortunately someone who has to see it to believe it. So to me, they're just good stories. Feeling like I knew all the critters that I could expect out there, I didn't think much of her barking. Anyways, we got into the tent and fell asleep around 9 p.m. Then I, ju then I jumped awake from a dead sleep at the sound of a spine-chilling ch uh, spine scream very close to my tent. It's hard to describe or imitate it, but it sounded angry, loud, and unlike anything I've heard before. I felt like it was screaming with his face directed right at my tent. It only lasted about 10 seconds. Only? <laughs> 10 seconds. Somebody tried to make a 10 second scream. But it felt like forever. And I just sat there listening for movement afterwards, trying to imagine what could make that sound and what I needed to do next. It went silent, so I laid back down, hoping it went away. But about 10 minutes later, I heard a big tree fall from a different direction, but still very close to me. I opened my tent and looked up to see to see if it had gotten windy, trying to justify a tree falling now, but all the branches were still. That was it for me. I jumped out and did a quick scan of the campground with my headlamp and then threw all my stuff in the back of my rig, including my scared dog, and I ripped out of my campsite, but was stopped by the tree that had fallen. It was within 100 feet of my spot, fully blocking the only road out. That sucks, and that's why in the past, I don't know how long you've been here, but I've always encouraged anyone and everyone who goes in the woods with their motor vehicles, pack a chainsaw just for this. Just for this, pack a chainsaw. Especially you guys on quads that are going in the middle of nowhere. Right? Always pack that chainsaw just for this. And other reasons. I only had an axe with me. And I wasn't about to start in that middle of the night. 
Sorry, I wasn't about to start that in the middle of the night, not being able to explain all these events. I parked back at my campsite and tried to sleep in my car, but that didn't happen. About five hours later, I saw headlights behind the fallen trees, so I walked out to find a group of bow hunters trying to get in. They said they didn't pack a chainsaw because there was no wind in the forecast. I told them it wasn't windy at all, but I didn't mention the scream because I felt crazy. They were set on hunting up there, so luckily they came back with a chainsaw a few hours later. Here are the pictures I took of the trees show how big it was and where it broke. Five feet above the ground. Five feet. No wind. Fir tree. I looked for other down trees or branches on my way out, but I didn't see a single one. When I got back into cell service, I looked up mammal screeches, including cougars and foxes and fishers, but nothing matched what I heard. The events being that something spooked my dog, then she pissed it off with her barking, which in return got her screamed at, and a big evergreen falling within 10 minutes of the strange scream. Really has my head spinning. All right, so this is gonna save me time if I can do it this way, but here is the tree in the headlights. All right, let's try that. Tree in the headlights. That's an in-your-face tree, and there's no other. Okay, hold on a minute. Now I gotta get my screen back to, come on, really? My screen won't go back to regular view. It's locked on the side view. Gotta be kidding me, come on. Here we go. Hold on, you guys. I'm screwing up. And there's where he uh, decided to hit it with the axe a few times. Done. I can't count how many times I've done that with my horse. Pack train of horses in the middle of nowhere and jumping off with your axe and slicing trees nonstop. But those ones are a big pain in the ass. It actually looks like it might be a spruce. I'm not the best at Okay, and here's where the break was. There you go. There you go. I have to see it to believe it myself. Now imagine if you uh, went home and explained the scream that you heard to who you trust at home and everybody who you trust at home looked at you and said, <laughs> I'd have to be there to hear it for myself. Anyways, right? Kind of sucks, doesn't it? Kind of sucks. I'm not saying that, uh, you know, people saying, oh, I got to see it before. I got to see it for myself. That doesn't harm anyone. But when somebody confides in you and sees you as a safe place to share what they saw, and if you say that to them, then it's not going to be received very well. <laughs> All right? Just like now you know if somebody said to you, well, I'd have to hear it for myself. Think about how that's going to make you feel. Not that it's about feelings here. It definitely isn't, right? Especially with me. I'm babbling a couple copies into it. Thanks for sending that in, man. Thanks for sending that in. Next one's titled Sabe. Good evening. I'm wanting to write our experiences, but haven't because the last time I contacted some Bigfoot group, I was told that what we saw was not real. No, that's unfortunate. I grew up in Montana. I have relatives who live in the Flathead on the Flathead Reservation. I heard stories of how dogs would disappear. They would look into my uncle's home through the windows, scream or yell and scare my mom, my aunt and uncle at his home. That's not what I want to share with you. My daughter and I live near the Bison Range in a tiny town. I believe we were followed home by a Sabe family. Odd things would happen, especially at night. We'd be in the living room quietly talking, and we'd get struck with fear. We didn't turn on any interior lights, but didn't see anything outside. It was pitch black. I refer to my dogs as crazy ones, total weight about 15 pounds. They would play until something would come, and then they'd hide under the blankets on the sofas. I would let my daughter sit in the lazy boy by the window because I had a bad feeling. I didn't want something breaking through the windows to grab her sitting there. I had a couple of dreams that the male Sabe kept showing me one of my little dogs. In my dream, I told him to leave my dog alone. Later, that same little dog passed away. The Sabe 
come to me in my dream one more time and I told him that my, do that my dog died and he never come to me again. One morning there was a huge handprint on the window next to the kitchen. I didn't, me I didn't measure it unfortunately, but it was huge. I took a picture to document. I no longer have the picture because that phone was broken. I was awoken over several different nights by voices. They sounded like drunks talking back and forth. Not slurred, but gibberish. I couldn't make out any words. Sometimes there would be hoots, but these weren't from owls. I had heard someone walking by the house one night with thumps. I called the police dispatch and they heard the thumps over the phone too. I was told not to go outside and I just said for the officer to be really careful. The officer let me know there was nothing found except that was on the roof. I was terrified. I wasn't part of what was happening that night, but I showed the picture to the police to show something has been hanging around. There was a police report filed, but nothing more happened as expected from the police. One day in the field across from the living room, I saw something cloaking itself, similar to the Predator movies, without the flashes. I realized how these beings move around without being seen, and it frightened me when I realized they could be anywhere, anytime. My daughter had gone out with her cousins one night. They had brought a listening device. She said that whatever was walking had very heavy footsteps, and you could tell it was bipedal and not a bear. There were wood knocks, too. We didn't make it a year living there. We moved towards Seattle and lived more urban. I miss living in the country, but I don't relish having any Sabe around. While we never saw them, I do believe they exist, especially after everything we experienced. I don't know that they are the benevolent protectors of the forest. Treat them as you would any other predators in the forest. Always be prepared. I've been thinking, this is my opinion only, I believe that the dog men are devolving into hellhounds. There were stories of them protecting warrior burial sites, but as the world becomes more vile, these beings have become more evil. But as I said, this is just my opinion. I don't want your readers to attack me for sharing my thoughts on it. My birth name is Mona, and you can use it. Thank you for using your voice to share experiences far more and more people from sorry sorry <laughs> thank you for using your voice to share experiences from more and more people this is a safe place and now maybe maybe i can finally let it go and bra bravely move back to the country god bless you and your family god bless you and your family mona i appreciate you sending that in and i would encourage you to move back to the country i guarantee you one thing that the country is definitely more healthier and safer than any city especially today and without a doubt what's coming to our in our in our futures here's another one they are telepathic hi steven really enjoying your program and have recommended it to my like-minded friends my name is judy and i'm a follower of christ with an interesting gift i'm a discerner which means that I hear, sense, and see what others don't. You'll see why this is relevant in a bit. I was raised in the coast range of Oregon, lived there until the age of 10, and in all that time we never encountered Sasquatch, although we did see bears, cougar, bobcat, and wolves. Yes, I said wolves. Even though the Department of Fish and Game and Wildlife only admitted their presence a few years ago. Like we need them for an answer for anything. Straight up. I'm now 67. We had family that lived in White Salmon, Washington, which is Bigfoot country. We visit. We visited often. My uncle drove a logging truck. They lived in a very remote area, and the road to their house had been cut through a tall clay embankment about 20 feet across. He arrived home from work as white as a sheet. Now, my uncle had a tendency to tell tall tales, but he had proof of what happened that night. As he drove down the road, he noticed movement to his left. A huge hairy foot and leg stepped off the 10-foot bank onto the cab of his truck and onto the other side. No way. He said it felt like a huge boulder had dropped onto his truck, but that foot and leg said otherwise. The truck was parked under a big outdoor light, so they pulled the ladder out and climbed up to where they had a good view of the cab. It had been a, If it had been a boulder, 
it would have left gouges in the metal. There were none. Just a huge human foot shaped dent sprinkled with the red clay from the surrounding area. First heads up for us that Bigfoot exists. Second heads up. In my late teens, I traveled with my dad and his band all over the United States and Canada. Buzz Martin, the singing logger. We were scheduled to play at the Logger Festival in Willow Creek, California. As we came down the hill into the, into the town, a huge carving of Sasquatch greets you on the right. We checked into our hotel and contacted the owner of the logging company who had booked us. We decided to meet in the morning for breakfast. And as we were talking and eating, a huge commotion caught our attention. Two of the logger's sons came through the door and were both scared to death as, and as mad as wet bobcat. Some outdoor music just flashed up. Oh well. Sorry for that. Apparently they had been having problems with vandalism on a landing nearby, but what they found that morning had taken it to another level. Up to that point, it had been lunch boxes stolen, pickup beds, rifled, and similar things. This time, whatever was responsible had stopped playing and wanted to be heard. Everything was destroyed. Down to the loader and D9 cat, and amongst the chaos were several pairs of huge footprints and tufts of red and black hair. Dad wanted to go see the damage that wasn't allowed. Modern day. My husband and I are hunters. We now live in the foothills of the Cascade Mountains in Oregon. The white-tailed deer here are small, but usually plentiful. Three years ago, I was walking the edge of a freshly logged area when suddenly everything went still. No bird song, no wind, no nothing. Things still recording, yeah? I was about two-thirds of the way around the cut when I clear clearly heard a wood knock. My first and only so far. I paused for a moment and made sure the smoke from the scrub piles were still going straight up and it was so no chance of it being a falling no chance of it being a fallen branch then at the same pace i continued my walk to the pickup i turned to my husband and said let's go there's nothing here we hunted a while longer with no success when we returned home he asked why i'd been so quiet when I told him that I'd heard a wood knock, he asked why I hadn't told him, and I said it took me a while to process it. Latest encounter. Sorry, this is so long, but I'm nearly done. This season was also very unsuccessful. They've blocked off so many of the back roads that there's a lack of hunting grounds and more and more hunters. We were out on a weekday, just before dawn, found a place we could hunt with no one around. We skirted the gate and were faced with a fork in the road. We chose the right fork as it was more level, and my husband has no left foot. As we walked the road beneath the leafless deciduous trees, everything seemed fine until... Up ahead on the road was a scorched area. A perfect rectangle about 8 by 6. Excuse me. Nothing else was touched. At that point, my extra sense started poking me. When my husband asked if we should continue, I said yes. There was a curve ahead in the road, and as we rounded it, the scenery changed. Ahead was dense Douglas fir, but it was twisted in such a way as to look like a cave and was very black inside. And suddenly I heard a very clear voice say, you can't go in there. At my sudden stop, my husband looked at me and I repeated what I had heard. Without question, he turned and we returned to the truck. I was so shook up that we decided to be done for the day. As we talked later, we decided to try the left fork the next day. In the middle of the night, a very loud voice told me, You're not supposed to go. It was so loud, I was sure that my husband had heard it also, but when the alarm went off at 4 o'clock and he got up, I asked him what he was doing. He said, When he said hunting, I told him about the voice and what it said, and he came back to bed. A little later, I saw you on with Nino and went to explore your website. I learned a few important things. First, the voice I heard was not the Holy Spirit, which I am very familiar with. It was deeper. And that scorched rectangle, a UFO created? I expect to hear that voice again as this incident is not keeping me out of the woods. I felt no fear. I was simply unsettled. Not much scares me. Thanks for listening, and thanks for your upfront honesty. Looking forward to your latest video. Judy?
Perkerson. Judy, I absolutely appreciate you coming out with your honest experience. The voice in the head thing. I've, I've mentioned that a few times. My personal thoughts on that. I'm not looking forward to something like that. But hopefully, if, if it does happen to me, I hope that I have it in me to stand my ground and talk with it. Maybe, if you're not scared and you're going back there, and if you do have it happen, ask it why. Say, what's up? Why can't I go ahead? Who are you? Who are you? What gives you the authority over me? How come you're telling me what to do? What's going on? Come on, give me some answers. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Wouldn't that be handy if, if, I mean, that's gonna be a pretty terrifying thing for anybody. You all of a sudden hear a voice in your head, bold voice saying, turn around right now or you're gonna die, or you can't go forward, get out of here. That camera's warmed up, got too hot. I mean, I have two different new GoPros and what they do indoors is, is they overheat. I mean, so hot to touch, it's crazy. But anyway, where did I leave off there? I was talking about what I would do and how scary that must be for anyone who's never experienced anything like this ever before, never had any mental health issues, never had any, uh, never second guessed their skills or abilities in the forest and the mountains. And all of a sudden one day, after a lifetime of running around the woods of the forest, a great big, deep, intimidating voice enters your head and tells you what's up. What? Right? It or when it happens to me. Hopefully I got the balls to stand my ground and engage it. We'll see. We'll see. Appreciate you sending that email in. And I wonder if maybe if I don't know if you want to or not, or somebody out there knows of this, but I'll, I'll bet you that when you have something like that happen, something stands on the hood of a frickin' logging truck, there's probably going to be some pictures of that, and there's going to be more than one person knows firsthand that experience because they're probably in the yard, the mechanic, the body shop, the owner, the manager, the boss, all the above are going to know of that incident and possibly have pictures, and I'll bet you some of them are listening to this YouTube channel right now, right? And the contractor, the owner, the operator, the other trades guys who saw all of that logging equipment dummied and trashed in the footprints and the hair, there's a lot of people. There's a lot of people being conditioned to keep their mouth shut, right? But I will bet you, dollars to donuts, some of those people are watching this channel too, sitting there in the background, not saying shit. And if you are, you can, you can contact the people through me anonymously, safely here. And if you want to uh, share a little more detail what's going on, what went on around there, share my story at howtohunt.com. All right? We won't say shit. We won't expose you. We'll keep you safe. We just want the knowledge. That's it. We just want the knowledge and or to help you. Here's another one. Music belting away. There's a swimming pool out there. Sarah's down by the down there by the pool getting her last sun rays in before she goes home to snow and sludge <laughs> hell. Sasquatches of Sprout Lake. That'll be my people, just up the road from the house. This story happened in 2022. 2022, that's when I was getting stuff thrown at me on video near Sprout Lake. Me and my cousin Kelly, me and my cousin always like exploring mountains, so we climbed a mountain up in Sprout Lake and here's how our story goes. We're walking an old grade and we noticed that some of the rocks in front of us were being flipped and being hunters, we spot, you know, the littlest things, you know, like a branch break or anything like that. As we're hiking, there's no punctuation at all. Not even a period in the whole thing, okay? or or paragraphs so here we go bear with me but we'll get there we kept on noticing more and more rocks flipped over so we know something was in front of us could have been a bear or you know something big anyway or even another person but that day was so quiet and as we were hiking there as we were hiking there was one squirrel only one that chattered and they make a different noise when they get spooked any hunter knows the bush. You know when a squirrel makes different noises? Anyway, 
It wasn't us that spooked the squirrel. So we knew something was up, for sure. Excuse me. As we kept on hiking, my cousin Kelly was really looking around far more and more. For more and more sign, sorry, for more and more sign of whatever was in front of us. We hiked out about a mile or two, then we thought we'd just circle and go back, go back down, back down, <laughs> sorry. We hiked about a mile or two, then we thought we'd just circle and go back down, back down, as we were hiking back down to another grade. It's exactly how it's typed out, right? Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> we had to cut across that to hit the truck. Well, there you go. What are we looking at? My cousin Kelly says, look at this. I walk over to him. Believe it or not, Steve, this is crazy. There's a liver from a deer on a stump still warm with blood on it, right? No marks, nothing. No deer carcass, nothing around. And the only way to get there is to hike. Okay? And it's only about 15 minutes from your house. I know it's crazy. Or maybe 20. So we looked at the liver and we started getting pretty spooked. My cousin Kelly kind of freaked out. His eyes went really big because being hunters and stuff, you know this should have... There should be a deer or something laying there. It was going, it was going to drag marks. There was no blood. There was nothing, just a warm liver. He put, he picked it up and looked at it. No chew marks. Now we put the liver back and on the stump and we left running out of there as fast as we could. Basically, I mean, it was pretty freaky, right? But really, really, we should have took the liver because it was given as a gift. And that's what it was for, that's why it was there. And years ago before that, I found a Sasquatch then maybe three miles away from the exact area in the thickest, wildest area. You can imagine me and a friend of mine, Mark, and that's another story. Like I say, I have many stories. Thank you for reading this, Steven. You take care and you can use my name, Leon Poirier. Okay, Leon, that sounds pretty freaky. You're close by. You know what, maybe if you want, if you want, one day you can come over to the, the man cave and uh, sit out in the shop with me and we'll bullshit and you can share it all in one go. Live even. Who gives a shit? We'll share it all with me through the people in the man cave with me, all right? What would I do? I don't know what I would do. I definitely, my head would be swiveling around my torso like a wind-up toy like a bobblehead looking for something around me that would be pretty alarming especially considering all predators eat the heart and liver first right of any kill it's just what they do they don't take the hard part to eat and leave the easy nutrients nutrient rich part behind especially like that wow hey wow what do you say to that besides wow hmm Gifting instead of remaining anonymous. What's up with that one? That's another that's another confusing part too, right? Like I said earlier millions of times, humans are the easiest animals to avoid. They're so easy to avoid anywhere. Why? I mean, you've already successfully kept yourself hidden on that particular hill from those two particular um, experienced hunters. Then why would you do that? Why would you all of a sudden leave a liver on a stump for them and gift those two guys right there that have not seen you and don't know anything about you and you're all good. Nobody's going to bother you or talk about you or come looking for you. Well, I think I'll just dump this deer liver in front of these guys today, though. <laughs> How come? What's up with that, right? It's curious. And then if you took the liver, then what? Does that mean you got they got the green light to go to your house? I don't know. Does it? Maybe. That's a risk you're taking. Does that give them green light to come and pound on the wall of your house? Seems like they don't need much permission to do that anyway, right? And then what are you supposed to, are you supposed to leave something for them? Or are they going to come and help themselves to your next deer kill being a hunter? Who knows, right? There's a whole pile of different potentials 
I might go down there, but that's freaking interesting. But anyway, make sure you message me again so I don't forget because I've got, I, I forget a pile of shit on here. I hear from so many people and I want to follow up and, and have them over and go see them. And, and every single day, it's just more and more and more and more and more. So please, for all who I've wanted to in the past have contact again and in person, make sure you email me back again, all right? Because my brain's a little frazzled at times. It kind of sucks, but I'm a one-man band and I'm doing probably a 20-man band task. Appreciate you sending that in. Make sure you email me again, all right? Okay, one more. Ooh, this is a long one. Okay, I'm going to do it. That's, that's it. Aha. Uh -huh. So you believe it now, do ya? Question mark. How honest is any marriage when it comes to Sasquatch? That's the title of this email. Hi, Steve and Sarah. Amazing how the top topic of Sasquatch can affect and challenge perceptions of honesty and truth with others in general, but especially with your own spouse. I just had a huge, to me, revelation dumped in my lap that I sure wasn't expecting. Not a big, spectacular, dramatic, quote, I actually saw one, end quote, type revelation, but the fact that my husband finally, after 41 years of marriage, admitted to me that he thinks he did have an encounter or two himself. So why now? All I can chalk it up to is the fact that in the last year or two since starting to watch your channel, and I've spoken of it to him, and feeling comfortable sharing with him my own experiences from when I was a teenager, Mr. I have to see it to believe it, finally felt comfortable enough to come clean about his own experiences now. It started last weekend. I was working on a project, listening to your most recent episode of the day, when my husband came in my studio and asked what I was up to. Quote, working on a project, listening to Sasquatch stories. End quote, I say. Why are you obsessed with these Sasquatch stories, he asks. Because it validates and revalidates for me that I experienced that what I experienced was real and opens my mind to new realities. I've wondered, wondered about it since I was 15 and had no one to talk about what I know really happened to me. It's real, honey. It's real. You can talk to me about it, he offers, as if he somehow feels left out of the loop. I did tell you before what happened to me, and yes, you listened politely, rolled your eyes a bit, admit it, but your response was, I'd have to see it to believe it, remember? That's not validating, sweetie, that's conditional acceptance of what I said, what I experienced. And that makes me feel like a, you're sort of a polite, dutiful husband listening, but it feels nothing like validation. But you're entitled to your opinion, and the thing is, the more I, ke I keep learning, the further away my understanding or believing it I know you'll be if indeed you have to see it to believe it. That is the sound of a long tail boat that just went ripping down a tiny canal over there. <laughs> Crazy. Man, that's a loud motor. Sorry. What do you mean, he asks. Like they can talk to you in your own head via mind speak. Like, they can enter portals and disappear into other dimensions. Like, they can go invisible and sneak up behind you, I tell them. You want to know more? Sasquatch aren't the only cryptid beings out there. There's dog men. I was expecting an eye roll at that share. I mean, come on. It is a lot for a Sasquatch novice to take in, no matter how you break it to him, right? And you believe all this just because some people... You don't even know, say it happened, he asks. How many of you, how many of you have had this exchange? Thousands upon thousands of people from all walks of life who have absolutely nothing to gain by sharing their, by sharing except getting it off their chest and feeling validated. At long last, most who wish to remain anonymous, all sharing two similar to be coincidence experiences. Yes, I believe them. And what are the chances you're ever going to run into one to even worry about this? He challenges me. Maybe because we hike, mountain bike, camp, and continue to research rural and remote retirement property in the Pacific Northwest. I'd say there's a damn good chance we could run into one. Or ten. Especially if your strange propensity for attracting creatures of all kinds. 
with chances like that, yeah, I'll be looking with whole new eyes for signs of Sasquatch activity before purchasing any piece of property that I'd want our kids and grandkids to come and visit, wouldn't you? For theirs, ours, and our animal safety, Sasquatch aren't all friendly, elusive types. He gets quiet, real quiet, like unusually quiet for him. Well, maybe I do believe it more than you think, he says. Oh, explain, I ask. Remember our last trip to Tahoe? When I took our son Nick on a four-wheeler up the Rubicon Trail? I did well, remember. We used to routinely spend a two-week summer vacation every year at a favorite house we always rented right near the Rubicon Trail. The Rubicon Trail, if you're not familiar, is probably one of the most demanding trails in the world for ATVers. It has some really rough sections that can only be accessed by ATVs or hiking over large rocks and boulders. If you Google it, you'll find photos of just how treacherous the trail can be in sections including an area called Little Sleuths. Husband and son spent an afternoon tackling it. They came back exhausted, filthy dirty, covered in trail dust, and very quiet. Funny, how can I easily flash back to that day and remember it well, especially the dirt making them hose off outside before coming to the house, and how quiet they both were. At the time, I just chalked it up to them being wiped out tired from the challenge of the trail, and he went on. Quote, Going up the trail, we had to stop several times. A couple times, the wheelers stalled out, or we just needed to rest because it was so physically tiring getting over the boulders. On a couple of those rests, we both noticed how we felt like we weren't alone, yet there were no other people near us. And we heard some strange animal howls a distance away, but also uncomfortably close sounding. I figured it was a mountain lion, but honestly, it didn't really sound like a mountain lion howls I'd heard before. But that's what I said to Nick, to sort of fluff it off and assure him there was no chance a mountain lion was going to get close to the noise of the wheelers when we started up again. We passed McKinney Lake, Lily Lake, then on to Miller Lake and stopped for lunch. Nick got his Nikon camera out of his pack, took some black and white photos of the lake. While he was doing that, I noticed it got really quiet, like deathly quiet. Prior to that, we could hear birds, frogs at the lake edge, normal forest sounds. We ate the lunch, he packed us and drank water. We were just sitting on the wheelers enjoying the view, but the quiet, creepy feeling hung in the air. We decided to head back, and the two of us didn't talk about the weird feelings again. I didn't think a whole lot about it until that same night. You and the kids had already gone to bed, and I sat out on the deck outside our bedroom playing guitar, and I heard some howls again coming in, coming from the forest that did not sound like mountain lions, bears, or wolves coming again from the direction of the Rubicon Trail, and it was really creepy. It was then that I started wondering if what I was hearing was the same thing that might have been around the trailer earlier. And yeah, Sasquatch came to mind. I didn't say anything at the time. I knew it would sound crazy, and I didn't want to scare the kids. But that's also why I didn't want to do that trail again with any of the kids, or you, when you wanted to hike it on foot the next day. I did remember that, and I remember thinking it's strange at the time that as adventurous as Hubby usually is, he didn't want to hike the trail the next day with me, and our other kids, despite our excitement and previous plans to go. I figured he was just worn out from the exertion that previous day, but it was not like him to waste a vacation day not doing something adventurous as planned. His manta, mantra is always, play now, we can sleep when the trip is over. So I react, oh wow, and you're just telling me this now after all these years? Now after as much as I've talked about Sasquatch, my experiences and other stuff I've told you about what I hear other people share? I asked him incredulously, feeling sort of not sure if I felt lied to, info withheld, he had been Sasquatch creds unfaithful, lol, or what? Was his withholding that experience just because he hadn't seen it to believe it? But now he was rethinking that position. I also wanted to compare notes. I searched and brought up the Sierra sounds on YouTube and played them for him. He said, yes, that's what it sounded like. When a section of long, whooping howls played, I can't believe I recognized that, but yes, that is what the howls sounded like exactly. Bingo! Well, my dear, you too are a Sasquatch experiencer, whether you want to have to, whether you want to have to see it 
to believe it or not, I pronounced to him. Strangely, this has brought us closer on the subject. He admits they exist, and he feels he does know they are out there. Just not sure he buys into a lot of the paranormal aspects quite, quite so readily, yet. But hey, we're making headway. He seems strangely confident that he would be able to send a good intentions out, and they would read him and not be aggressive toward someone like him. But I find myself warning him not to be so confident in that. There are good and bad ones. His confidence scares me, quite honestly. Like, maybe I hope one day he would get the shit scared out of him so he'd listen to what I'm sharing with him more closely. In the meantime, I'm trying to have your channel on when he can when he can hear or overhear it and maybe take other stories at face value rather than just what I say. Anyway, I have to credit your channel, Steve, with not only giving me the validation I needed for years, but also helping open up lines of admission and credibility with talking to my husband about it and embracing what is most definitely real. Until folks can do that, it's hard to take the next steps of believing the full package, mystical, paranormal, and all of what is being revealed about these beings. So, thank you. Thank you both. I envy that you and Sarah can have daily conversations about this stuff and no one has to convince the other of anything, nor, quote, see it to believe it, end quote, even though you already have. Carol, withholding my full name, although I have no problem saying it for myself, but not sure my husband wants to be once it made public for business reasons. Baby steps. 41 years at a time, lol. Maybe this time next year he'll be a full-on listener to boot. It's a process, eh? And one I'm willing to go through. All right, Carol, appreciate that. I think there's going to be a lot of people can relate to your experience with your husband, for sure, and your conversations. And you're probably going to knee-jerk somebody into having possibly a more serious conversation with their spouse or the friend or family member, right? Anyway, holy cow, it's getting hot in here quick. Turn the air conditioner off so it wouldn't make all that nasty noise, and it is, I'm in a frickin' turkey oven on Christmas. Anyway, back tomorrow in the man cave. Back home. Crazy. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to getting people in there with me. And uh, we can talk to them together firsthand. But anyway, um, what else? I shared a link to Tucker Carlson and Jordan Peterson and another man, I forget his name, and they, they were invited to Canada, to Alberta, which is one of probably, probably one of the best places to live in Canada. And they're invited to speak, and I put that link in there. Whether or not you have personal issues with either one of them or don't like them because of whatever they may have done, or said, I don't know, whatever, whatever your issues are, and if you're not going to watch that link to the video, what I would like to share with you is this. Overall, what I found, the main theme of their message to people as a whole was to be honest and be kind. That was their main, that was the main theme of their talk. They did speak of truth, a lot of truth that's going on out there. They didn't make up anything. They didn't make up anything or try to discredit anyone intentionally, they read a lot of truth out loud to the people, truth that needs to be heard. And um, I was very, very stoked and excited to see that these people were doing this. It's like, oh my God, thank God. And I'll bite my lip there. If you're curious, or if I could encourage any of you to just listen to it, all right, please just skip me, skip the next week of my videos to watch their video, please. And they carry on. <laughs> All right. Anyway, there you go. I'm out of here. I'll be back again. Share my story at howtohunt.com. That is where you get it heard word for word and shared with the world. I think we hit, I think we're over 320,000 subscribers the other night, I think. And uh, who knows what there is, how many more, 10 times more than that and watch and listen to you here. So there you go. I'll be back later.